here to honor uh, Jack's legacy of transformative learning. I'm going to share a little bit about where it started with the Women's Reentry Study Program, where he first wrote about and thought about transformative learning. Uh, and then Ted Fleming, who is um, I not only studied with him, but he also has advanced this work in, in Europe uh, with the successor to Jürgen Habermas, uh, whose name is Hanneth, Axel Hanneth at Columbia University, in the use of recognition theory in interpreting and thinking about transformative learning. So he will be next. And then Ellie, who does a lot of work in, a, in transform, transformation theory in constructive developmental learning, and change. We'll talk a little bit about how Jack's work and constructive developmental learning is different, how they differ from one another and how they are like to one another. Followed by Lyle, who is in some ways expanding the thinking of Jack's by moving to an, an additional framework in which he looks more holistically at the affective and social dimensions of learning. Uh, then we are going to, Jeannie Bitterman is going to begin sharing a little bit about how many of our students have used these ideas in their own research and practice and highlight some of what they've done through a communities of practice course that we have. And then our two graduates of our program, Gwendolyn Kaltoft uh, and Rachel Sapor, and Gwendolyn's going to be speaking a bit about transformative learning theory in the hospice and end of life in environment, and Rachel in the executive and manage managerial area. Um, uh, I can't help but brag that Rachel received a dissertation award for her wonderful dissertation on this topic. So, so that's the itinerary. <laughs> this is the little book that you see on the screen. And this is the book that the Center for Adult Education published on the study of reentry women in community colleges. Uh, in which Jack developed his ideas about uh, trans perspective transformation or began to develop his ideas. And he was inspired in this work by his wife, Edie. So we always think of Jack and Edie as a pair. They really uh, were a pair in many, many ways. Uh, and Edie, when she went back to school, were go was going through the kinds of things that Jack looked at and said, oh my goodness, this is very much like perspective transformation using those ideas uh, as developed from the current uh, thinking at the time in both Paulo Freire around conscientization, as well as in women's consciousness raising. And Jack was very uh, kind of intuitively linked to the idea that these community colleges are doing something amazing and we ought to study them. And so he got a grant from the Department of Education to study what these college programs looked like and how it is they supported women's development and change. So he really set out in some ways to look at curricular matters. Uh, uh, how, how does a college actually embody and support this kind of change? But I think what's enduring and what people really remember is this uh, idea of perspective transformation in individuals. And so I want to share with you a few highlights from that book and also some perspectives that I bring because I was a doctoral student at the time at the University of California in Berkeley. And so I had the privilege of really doing a lot of the data collection in the California schools. And at the time, I was studying with Barney Glazer grounded theory uh, for a couple of years, and that was what the approach was that they were using in the study. So I was able to uh, use that as my field project for my classes, et cetera, and made some contributions to this little book, which I found uh, uh, when I was recently going through his books and papers, which I, which I now have, and we hope we'll be able to make them available to people once we figure out what we actually have. But I did find some of the interviews from this study, and I found some of the work that I had done on the California piece. And so I'm going to share with you a little bit of that. And I think it helps illuminate some of uh, both the strengths and also the challenges that people sometimes find in Jack's work. So you have to go back to the 1970s. Some of you weren't born yet, I know. Uh, but for those of us, some of us wish we were back there in the 70s, probably. <laughs> Um, and as I said, this was a study that really did focus on uh, curriculum matters. Uh, so Jack actually was pioneering a methodological approach that was a survey-based approach called perspective discrepancy assessment, in which he looked at the different points of view of everybody in the situation and tried to understand where the gaps were and how to move things forwards. And he was very interested in what the curriculum looked like. 
But as we move forward in the study, and this was very pronounced in the California piece, it was very clear that these women couldn't identify and look into themselves unless they had a lot of social support. And social support, higher education isn't necessarily known for providing a lot of social support, right? But in fact, these programs pioneered because a good base of what they did was to be able to, provi to provide kind of cushioning for women in a tough love sort of fashion that enabled them to really identify, to look into themselves and rethink uh, a lot of the places they've been and where they wanted to go. I think it's important to note that there was not one uniform community college nor one uniform women's program. And so we often think about this, uh, people who, who follow in this footsteps as thinking of middle class, perhaps white women who were uh, reading Betty Friedan and who needed to move into some other areas uh, in their lives and wanted to rethink some of what they were doing and who they were. But in fact, there were many people uh, from many different cultures and classes in these programs. And so the, the story that comes out of this, which is somewhat uniformly told in this little booklet, is actually more complicated if you begin to look at the field notes. Um, so um, one of the things that it does say in the report is kind of the germ or the basis for perspective transformation. And for those of you who are familiar with it, it is a process of looking into yourself and examining uh, assumptions that you took for granted in light of the so social expectations and critically looking at those and then making decisions for yourself based on a reassessment, if you would, of yourself. Uh, it involves perspective taking, trying on different roles and integration in a new role in life. But of course you can't do that if you're a woman who's changing your role in society and so it also involved reaching into the community and helping women uh, move forward in that way as well. So what was really the strong point in this study was the focus on agency and self-confidence. Uniformly across the programs, that is what they emphasized. But they also focused to some extent, and Jack really pointed this out, on consciousness raising. In fact, Jack thought that that was one of the key contributions of his study, although that's not what he's normally remembered for. In fact, he's usually criticized for not bringing enough of the women's consciousness raising perspective into his study, but it's there. If you go back and read it, you will find it. Um, the other thing, of course, is that his theory is often known and criticized for being very individualistic and very cognitive, and it is, but it's also true that in that early study, there was a lot of emphasis on social support, <coughs> modeling, uh, likening of administrators to women so that they didn't feel the social distance or power distance, graduates who came back who provided mentoring, Okay, she's gonna cut me off. <laughs> I just wanna add this one piece, <clears throat> which has to do with consciousness raising, because Jack could see that this contribution of these programs was really to help raise women's consciousness. But there was actually a very mixed picture in the community colleges, and so you'll see from the quote up there, and there are other ones much like it, that, there, that some people felt that women weren't ready for this kind of role, and they probably weren't. Uh, they might have been ready for it, but their families or their communities were not. And so there was this question of back and forth of how do you help women move and be more themselves, but also to keep in consciousness the role of society and how much they could challenge it at that point. So I'm going to stop because I've been told to <laughs> <laughs> and pass this on to Ted Fleming, who takes the theory in a somewhat different direction, drawing on Axel Honneth and recognition theory. Thank you, Victoria. Um, I want to say just a few things before I get to the meat of the recognition stuff. There are a number of reasons why uh, I've become interested in Axel Hanath's work. Uh, I studied with Jack in the late 70s and both of us studied Habermas together. Uh, I did my thesis on Habermas and I've since uh, edited a book on Habermas and education by Rutledge, published by Rutledge and I've done some work for the Teachers College Record looking at the work of Habermas. So I was quite interested in, in, in that topic. Uh, and one of the things I tried to do in that work is to critique, ex is to deal with the criticism mm -hmm. that there isn't a social dimension to Jack's theory of perspective transformation. And realizing that I was very lucky that studying Habermas lasted me as a topic all of my academic life. Uh, except that Honneth has come along as the third generation of critical theorists to spoil the party. But what a wonderful uh, addition uh, he has been. 
so if, trans, if the theory of perspective transformation or transformation theory is based so solidly on the critical theory of Habermas, then there's a real onus on those of us who are interested in that particular aspect of the topic to wonder what happens to the theory of perspective transformation when we look at the third generation of critical theorists. That's, there are two reasons. The, the third reason that, that I've got involved in this topic has to do with, with something that you, you, you mentioned. Mm -hmm. You see, being critically reflexive of your assumptions is a big ask. Uh, you have to be up early in the morning to do critical reflection. <laughs> it, 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 it doesn't come easy or naturally. So having said that, I, I'm always uncomfortable with teachers who want to make me critical. It ain't easy. Uh, and another reason, uh, I've been involved in a European-wide program amongst, in, in seven countries, looking, a little bit like Jack did in the 70s, at what happens to non-traditional students when they go back to university. And in the search for sensitizing concepts, I discovered Hanath. We'll get back to that. Another reason, uh, transformation theory is a living theory. And if it's living, what it means is that it's open, alive, active, open to empirical scrutiny and theoretical critique and development. So as a living theory, I want to keep doing that. Uh, I, I just, I should also, because it, th this is to recognize Jack and Edie's legacy, uh, I, I'm reminded that, that Hillary Clinton is probably announcing her candidacy today, is that right? Tomorrow. Uh, oh, tomorrow. <laughs> All the better. We'll, uh, 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 I remember walking down Broadway, and you'll know what year it might have been, because I can't remember. But I couldn't. Hillary Clinton was going for some election in New York. Was it the Senate? You will see, you do know. Uh, I was not allowed to pass a collection box to support Hillary Clinton's campaign. Jack insisted, and for one CD agreed. And she did not say, Jack, you can't do that. <laughs> I, uh, I think that uh, Jack and Dee Dee's moral compass uh, was focused very clearly in the direction of social justice. Uh, and on that day, I well remember that Hillary Clinton was probably as far left politically as Jack would go, and it was probably as far right as I would go. <laughs> we spent a lot of time in those years discussing whether he would make me a humanist or I would make him a socialist. <laughs> And just, uh, if these are introductory comments, and, and I, I think they're, they're appropriate, uh, I should also say that as a, as a foreign student in this college, it was a wonderful place to be. Uh, all, of the, all of your alumni who come from other countries come from countries who have much more limited opportunities. Uh, to come here and to work with Maxine Green, uh, Dwayne Hubner, uh, Hope Leichter, uh, John Broughton, mm -hmm. Philip Phoenix, have I missed anybody? Uh, you, know, you know, this was a wonderful experience and, and I appreciate uh, that. Yes. That's fine. Uh, what is Hanath on about? You will recall from your studies of Habermas that Habermas gave to critical theory a linguistic or a communicative turn. He said basically that the pathology in our society, the pathology, this is my socialist self, the pathology <laughs> in our capitalist society is one of distorted communication. And what Hanath has done is he said, the pathology in our society is one of disrespect. So it's of distortion, distortions in the way we recognize people. And Hanath has spent a good deal of his time mapping out what he means by that uh, struggle for recognition that he finds in people. Uh, and now, though Hanat doesn't say this, I'm going to say it, and I'm going to think that maybe, he'll, maybe he has said it somewhere, or he will say it. The struggle for recognition and respect is a lifelong task. That it's a lifelong task for infants who need to be acknowledged and respected by their parents, by their teachers, by their family, and by their community. And in that recognition, they grow. Without it, they don't. We know this from people like Winnicott and Bowlby and so on. However, because it's a lifelong task, we also know that in our society, we can be either respected or disrespected by the laws that give us rights to education, to health care, 
uh, to uh, dole to social welfare and all sorts of things uh, that give disabled people rights and so on. Uh, and not only do we achieve this recognition or, or not uh, in, in the legal framework or in the legal, uh, legal context, we also find that work is either a wonderful place for receiving recognition or for being disrespected. And it's because of this moment, uh, of, of, uh, or it's the importance of this struggle for recognition uh, that we begin to wonder, well, is this a way of looking again at that critical reflection that, that's, that's so difficult to achieve? And what I'm suggesting is yes, that, that this has uh, important implications for the theory of transformative learning. Uh, I'll, the only thing I really want to say uh, about uh, Hannah in, in wrapping up this section is to say that uh, we are social individuals and only as social individuals can we take up a critical stance. Social justice depends on intersubjectivity. Uh, I'm going to skip the piece on the empirical confirmations through a European research project <laughs> and simply to say uh, that there is an inbuilt social dimension in the theory of transformative learning and the pursuit of our identity uh, and the recognition issue come together in that. Uh, yes, uh, anyone who wants to teach for perspective transformation or teach people uh, to engage in a transformative learning process, we would do well to focus not only on the importance of critical reflection in that activity, but also to look at what it means to recognize people. Because what we find in our research, not only I, but Jack also, we find that when people go back to school, they're looking to recover and reclaim and recover from periods of misrecognition by society, by their community, by their experience of education. And in that process, they look to learning, they look to education to achieve that moment of recognition, which is profoundly developmental. Yes. So I think I would like to begin by inviting all of you to help me thank Victoria for putting this whole event together. Thank you. And I feel really honored to be here with all of you. And thank you all for coming and giving us a little piece of your time on this very exciting day here at Teachers College. Um, my name is Ellie Drago Severson. And um, thank you. Oh, that's much better. Um, I did have the pleasure and honor of meeting Jack Mesereau once, and I remember sitting down at his kitchen table and him telling me the story of how he developed this theory. So I feel very honored and blessed to have been part of his life, even if it was a tiny piece of it. And my role on this panel today is to talk about the relationship between transformative learning um, Jack Mesereau is the father of that, and many people, theorists, including Victoria Marsic, Lyle York, Stephen Brookfield, and lots of other people have taken up those reins and extended that theory, which is really basically about the importance of perspective taking and making shifts in our perspective taking. And while both Ted and Victoria have talked a lot about that, one of the images that Victoria and I often use to represent the distinction between transformative learning, I-V-E, and transformational learning, A-L, is this image, whoops, which is not up there yet. <laughs> there it is. So um, tra both transformative learning, which is um, the theory that Jack Mesereau developed, and transformational learning, which is the theory that Bob Keegan, who happened to be, and I want to give him a shout out, my teacher, advisor, and now cherished friend, um, both theories are really, really important, and they are interconnected, and they are different. So we thought it would be important just to highlight the differences that we see. So the branches represented in the tree really, for us, represent transformative learning, those are important changes, shifts in perspective. They can be aha moments that happen over time that help us to understand the world in very different ways. 
The other kind of learning that we do in life has to do with more about the roots of the tree, the internal changes that have to do with cognition, affect, or emotion, how we relate to other people and how we relate to ourselves, which we're going to refer to or I'm going to refer to as growth, internal capacity building, increases in our cognitive, emotional, person-to-person -person and self-to-self -self ways of relating to the world that help us to better manage the complexities of learning, leading, teaching, and living in today's 21st century. All of those adaptive challenges, you know, the new normal and collaboration and teaming, where do we learn to do those things? We really don't unless we come to teacher's college, take classes in those. Um, and yet those place internal demands on us, both implicit and explicit, that for many adults in the United States, both in schools, in for-profits, in other non-profit organizations, including universities, don't yet have the capacities to meet. So how many of us in the audience are familiar with Stephen Covey and the seven, now eight, habits of highly effective people? Yes, yes. So I have great respect for Stephen Covey. He's a man who dedicated his life to understanding what is it that professionals who are highly effective can do? What can they demonstrate in their workplace? So, you know, they can do things like begin with the end in mind. They can sharpen the saw, S-A-W. They can engage in conflict. They can take a stand for what they believe in. And those are not necessarily only um, habits that we develop over time. They're actually internal capacities that most adults in the United States, according to research, don't yet have. So the hopefulness, though, is that we can grow those in ourselves and each other, but um, the key to this is that we need each other to do that. So transform, may, how am I doing on time? Good, that's all I need. Um, <laughs> So transformational learning, getting at the roots, really um, constructive developmental theory is one theory that consists of a family of theorists um, that helps us to understand that three big principles. One, that we construct our experience moment to moment. We actually put it together in our minds. Two, that with the right kinds of supports and challenges, we can grow and develop over time, but that it's not a one-size-fits-all thing that adults make meaning with three very different ways of knowing, which I'm going to call instrumental socializing and self-authoring. And as you know, just as Jack Mesereau's transformative theory is very complex and we're just giving you a thumbnail sketch, so is constructive developmental theory. Um, so for some adults who make meaning with more of an instrumental way of knowing, they orient to the world in a very black and white way. They need to know what the rules are, and if you give them the rules and they follow them, they expect some kind of concrete reward. So for them, if you're sitting down for a goal-setting session, what they want to know is what are the right goals and tell me exactly what I need to do in order to achieve them. They do not yet have the capacity for abstract thinking in the psychological sense. For adults who are socializing in their knowing and the majority of adults in the United States have some degree of this in their meaning making. For them, what matters most is getting other people's approval. And this is really not just about wanting to be liked. I would argue that most of us want to be liked. We don't want to walk into a room and as soon as we get there, everybody stops talking or leaves. <laughs> this is really about needing another person in order to feel whole. So for them, they have the capacity now to think abstractly, to make generalizations, but what runs their day-to-day -day existence is having other people approve of them. What you as an authority figure or supervisor or loved one think of them, they think of them. Your judgments and expectations become their own. So for them in a goal-setting session, just for example, what they really need is they may come with goals but they want you to tell them what they should be working on because you know better than they do. So standing at the edges of their thinking and pushing their growth is really about helping them to look inside themselves for what they believe and to be able to speak it.
you know, in today's world, in teams, if we really want to build collaborative cultures and have everybody's opinion matter to the decision making, people have to feel free and safe to express themselves. That's not something that everyone can do yet. And um, the third most common way of knowing in adulthood are what I call self-authoring knowers. Um, and those are people who can demonstrate those habits of highly effective um, people spontaneously. They don't need anyone else to help them do it. For them, they'll come into a goal setting session with their own goals and basically what they want to do is talk them over with you and they want to give you feedback on your goals. So this matters in today's world because we need to not only help each other grow our capacities internal, but we also need to grow our own because our internal capacities influence how we can support each other. Thank you. Just like to acknowledge, first of all, yes, I'm very much aware that there's a lot of people in the room that were not yet born when I was doing some of this work. I was talking to a student not too long ago, and I said, you remember when Dick Walton wrote in the Harvard Business Review in 1972, he said, Lyle, I wasn't born in 1972. <laughs> uh, and in terms of the time to reflect, I'll have to try your early morning stuff. I think late at night with a scotch works pretty well, but that's my own, uh, uh, that's my own piece there, thinking about that. Uh, actually, the uh, moving down to the next slide there. Uh, to transformative learning as a how has it how has transformative learning theory expanded in other ways of understanding the uh, holistic ways of knowing and collaborative inquiry? And I'd like to say that uh, this actually grows out of my dissertation work, a, you know, a few decades ago now, and has actually continued but it's looking at how can we expand Jack's you know, theory, and, and it's still going on, and it's not a critique of Jack, it's really an expansion of Jack, and he was in fact very supportive of that throughout the time I was really working on it. In fact, he showed up at, uh, at our defense because we were doing a collaborative thing, as did Maxine Green, actually, who was also very you know, supportive of this. So I'm going to give a very high-level view of really thinking about that. First of all, why holistic ways of knowing? One of the early limitations that was acknowledged by Jack's theory and so forth was that it was highly cog cognitive, as a, a lot of my you know, colleagues here have said. And while he would you know, mention uh, the effective, he really didn't include that in the theory in any kind of developmental way. He was focusing on rational discourse and that piece, which is obviously also very you know, valuable. Uh, but it didn't deal with the effective piece. And as we started to talk about that and look at it, it began to, the way he redefined transformative learning somewhat, and this is, a, this is actually the definition that I, along with Elizabeth Castle, who I continue to work with, uh, define it as a holistic change in how a person effectively experiences and conceptually frames his or her experience of the world when pursuing learning that is personally developmental socially controversial or requires personal or social healing and self really dealing with the kind of issues that many times elicit defensiveness, elicit a sense of uh, going into defensive routine uh, and also with the other kinds of situations where the emotional starts to you know, trigger. In looking for a more holistic theory became very much involved with the work of a fellow who's now in New Zealand, John Hearn, who has developed a uh, holistic theory using a phenomenological approach, which differs from more of the approach of pragmatism and so forth, which of course has a history of dealing at the cognitive you know, level. I'm going to go through this very quickly in order to make a couple points. If we look at John's you know, basic you know, theory, he talks about four ways of knowing. Ex experiential knowing, presentational knowing, you know, propositional knowing, and practical knowing. And there's two key points there that I would actually make is his use of the term which goes out of the phenomenological research of experiential is different from the way we have historically talked about experiential learning in the literature such as Kolb and so forth, which again is very you know, cognitive. What he's actually, how he is actually defining the term you know, presentational knowing and sort of a shortcut here is it derives from embodied effective resonance with the phenomena from its pre it's tacit, it's not linguistic, it's really being in relationship with it. Presentational knowing is intuitive grasp of imaginal patterns and finds expression in stories, artistic forms, and metaphors, 
Propositional knowing is based on observable evidence expressed in intellectual concepts rooted in logic that could be either verbal or also mathematical. Practical knowing is the capacity to take you know, competent action. His point there is that the foundation is experiential, and in fact, when we're actually taking action, we're always adding to the experiential knowing that we're not fully even aware of many times. And one of the values of the presentational is many times it helps us bring into conscious awareness some of this more tacit kinds of, of knowing. The other piece that underlies those, and I realize I'm jumping rather quickly through this, is what he calls modes of psyche. But these are what really parent those different ways. For example, the experiential knowing is parented by the affective. And each of these, by the way, each mode of psyche has two poles in terms of a continuum. One pole is individualizing, the other is much more in terms of the participatory. At the individualizing side is emotion. When I feel emotion, I'm separated. Even if it's a very positive emotion, it's, it's separated. Felt feeling is one of being aware of the integration with the environment, being part of the environment, embedded in the environment. Uh, moving, up to the, moving up to the expressive or the presentational way of knowing, it has two poles there. The mode of psyche is imagery, but on the participatory side, it's really uh, intuition, and that, which eventually gets translated into concrete images which represent the way we as individuals reflect that. And just to give you a couple examples of that, one is how a lot of really creative artists work. They feel connected with the broader world, they start playing with their intuition, eventually they come up with objects that other people connect with many times on an emotional level, but is also open to those other people from a hermeneutic perspective, their own interpretation of what it means. Moving up then to the conceptual level, on the participatory side is reflection on how all this is operating. On the individualizing side is what we're engaged in right now is really discrimination the term used in terms of how we operationalize things is the subject-object split. And then there's intention and at, at the top and then action at the top. Now, it's, all of those things are viewed as being absolutely critical, but are you able to engage with the world with what Hearn would say is critical subjectivity, meaning you're aware of how those things are always playing out. Uh, are you aware of the fact many times that your conceptual knowledge of the world, your, how you're in that relationship with the world, doesn't feel right? You know, it goes back to actually uh, a debate that went on, uh, uh, you know, during the, you know, Vietnam War, where uh, actually Robert McNamara, many times, who was very, very cognitive and very much in terms of the quantitative side, some of his people would say, Mac, this doesn't feel right. And he'd say, how can it not feel right? And he'd start to show the numbers. So how does that play out? What does it relate to having collaborative inquiry? What is collaborative inquiry? And I'm just going to jump to here. Collaborative inquiry is a way of engaging in a form of research where a group of people go through repeated cycles of action and reflection but they're doing it in such a way that they're engaged holistically with those full ways of knowing. Presentational knowing allows us to deal more effectively if it's used and it's not easily used uh, to deal with the paradox of diversity. We know that when you're involved with diverse groups, there's a great opportunity to learn, but particularly with the kinds of challenges that were on that first slide that are very controversial, whatever, it's very hard to engage in effective dialogue if we don't understand the lived experience of the people with who we're dialoguing with. And what presentational knowing does is actually give people the opportunity to have that experience going through. And making those transitions is absolutely you know, critical to move from the individualizing side, which also has adult development implications, I think, to the uh, more you know, to the participatory side. And that's a, that challenge can only be done by going through a lot of repeated cycles of actually playing with it. And I have a number of examples of how that's been done, working with the Wagner School and also working with a number of other organizations. So, yes. Um, I'm Jeannie Bitterman, and um, Jack was my sponsor. And um, I like to think that I met Jack pre-transformative learning. 
Um, and I actually met him in 1976 and came here in 1977. And it's kind of interesting because I too was sponsored like Ted was. Um, and we have a lot of similarity in our interests. Um, but I'm gonna take this in a different direction because what is the value of transformational theory? Where, what do we do with it? What does it tell us in terms of our practice? And Jack, um, amongst his many, many accomplishments, wanted to design a graduate program that would encourage transformative learning. So I hear Ted saying, oh, wait a minute, you know, someone's gonna try to force me to, <laughs> to, to, to critically reflect early or late in the day, I, you know. But Jack thought, well, if we take away, if we take away some of the competition, if we put diverse people in a room, right, if we encourage them to critically reflect and challenge their assumptions, they'll transform. Um, so I, I loved the idea, right? Um, but the, and I wasn't a participant, I predated. So, but what do we do with it? So Jack's impression on my work has been to continue to grapple with how do we encourage and help people transform, but what are they transforming from and to? And this is where the legacy of Teachers College and why so many of us come here um, is so important. So we believe, and if you don't believe when you get here, we'd like you to believe when you leave, um, <laughs> that social justice and equity matter. They, they matter because it is a social world. And how do we encourage people to have their consciousness raised without feeling threatened and shut down. And lo and behold, doctoral students, just like community college students, they want their moment of recognition, right? And so I'm gonna talk about how I've played with transformative theory in trying to enact supporting people in this journey of challenging their own assumptions. But everybody comes with different readiness. So I'm here to honor Jack's legacy by honoring our students who actually, through action research projects, have been encouraged to challenge their own assumptions. So um, within the umbrella of the Aegis program, with the, which is an alternate um, cohort doctoral program that many of you may know about, but it, the details don't matter, right? It's a two-year program but it's still somewhat conventional in that it's designed around courses. So how do we bring people in once a month to have, when we have all this diversity in the room, to have sustained dialogue about things that matter, about themes of inclusion and exclusion, about privilege, about race and class? How, how do we do that? How does that happen in a safe way? Um, it turns out it may not be so safe in the large group setting. I mean, ideally, we could create that, but you know, we, we've been struggling with it. So um, I helped to design a course that is ever evolving, which actually goes beyond the one semester design and goes into three semesters. So the first fall, and I'm not saying this is ideal, I'm saying what the intent was, right? The, the intent was to give a more sustained conversation, right? By having students identify topics that are of interest to them, right? By having them be inclusive and form groups that aren't exclusionary, and by um, having them through doing action research together, get practice experience. Because within that context of being real world researchers, they have to deal with the difference of their perspectives, how different people are approaching the problem, how different people are thinking about the problem. And in fact, for many of these people, regardless of the topic they choose, it ends up being about perspective transformation. Right? So I am just gonna very, very quickly talk about some of these, I'm probably not gonna get a chance to talk about them. But I'll flip through the slides, and if you folks want, we can probably put up, because I notice a lot of people are taking pictures of these slides. That's kind of silly in this day and age. We should post these slides. If you want these slides, we'll post them somewhere, <laughs> right, right? Okay, so um, from some of the, um, so we have very, we, we have a very diverse population, and that's an incredible richness, 
right? But it's when this diversity is working together on a problem that people have an opportunity to dig deeper, right? So I'm just going to, I just picked out some from various um, cohorts. So you can see the titles there, okay. So we had a, an African-American woman and um, um, a white, co white Caucasian, right? <laughs> uh, a self-identified white male. Um, very interested in race and dialogue and race. And what they did in an action research project was to select themes, um, movies, articles that were of interest to them, and try to expand Argyris's framework and say, how can we dig deeper here? Let me not just record what was said. Let me not just record what I was thinking. Let me see if I can engage in an honest dialogue and tell you what I think you're thinking and then you can tell me if I was right, right? And through this process, they went very, very deep. Um, whether that's been sustainable in terms of their raised consciousness is a whole other story, right? Okay, um, another group. Um, this was a group, I've put their names, of six very diverse women um, who, they, they called themselves the diversity divas. So however you feel about the connotation of calling oneself a diva is um, <laughs> up to you. <laughs> but um, they decided to explore, and I have the quote from them, but they decided to explore their own cultural heritage. And the way that they did it was very much in line with a collaborative inquiry where they met outside of any structured course time. They met in each other's homes. And for each session that they met, they brought something of their cultural heritage a dance, a poem, food, which they then shared. And then they had and recorded a journal, which they shared in a Google site online. And then they thematized it, and they have gone on to write book chapters and present. And it was transformative for them, and they did feel that they went from the I to the we. Right? Um, another group in one cohort, we had um, two Hispanic males struggling with finding their voice. They both came from different Caribbean islands and they came from collectivist cultures and in their desire for a moment of recognition, they wanted an individualistic voice. So how did they go against the hegemonic influence which in a cohort is naturally to say, we want a group identity. But wait a minute, not everyone wants a group identity, right? And so they posed certain questions to themselves which they then reflected upon. I'm out of time. So I'm just doing this so you can see the names of the people. And I would like to honor the people who are in the room because we have a cohort here who are working on five very, very interesting different projects. And you do see that these themes continue. Vulnerability, empathy, the arts, and I think that we are honoring Jack's legacy. My name is Gwendolyn Kaltoft, and I am, I think, probably legitimately the only non-academic on the panel at the moment. Um, and I'm really honored to be able to be here because of representing all of the people in uh, the United States and all over the world that are working in this area of perspective transformation, transformative learning, that are not necessarily privileged to be able to be in the academy and do the kind of, and have the research as a background, etc. So for those of you who are in those arenas, I would say, you know, give yourself a very big <laughs> congratulations for being here because this is frequently, uh, it's a wonderful, rich environment to come to. And, um, but I'm just going to tell you a little story about me, first of all. When I came to Columbia, which was in the middle 80s, um, I was in one of the early cohorts of the Aegis program that they've been mentioning. And um, I came from the Midwest, from southwest Iowa, and I had a very great childhood and, you know, respectable parents and all of that, but I didn't know anything about Columbia University. I didn't know who, where Columbia was. I didn't, I'd never been to New York City, and I was working in the middle 80s in the area of displaced homemaker work in um, Pennsylvania. 
And um, that was very similar. It was on a vocational technical level of the work that Victoria has been talking about in terms of the reentry program that D Jack originally um, founded his work in. And I found out through my series of people about the program, about prospective transformation, and it really resonated with me. And I thought, oh, this is someplace I should, this is somebody, Jack Mesereau, I need to learn mm -hmm. about, I need to meet. So I came, I applied for the program, I was accepted. Then I started to sort of capture where I was and what was, what I was really, the richness that I was surrounded by. And I, and I just am very, I wanted to be here today. I didn't really necessarily know I was going to be on the panel <laughs> early on, but I was just so wanting to be here today to honor Jack because, he's, because of the huge place that he has occupied in my life, as well as Elizabeth Castle, who was my sponsor, Maxine Green, who was on my committee, um, and, and Stephen Brookfield, many of you maybe know. So um, I'm just going to pause for a minute before I move into the, the area that I've been working with in the last 13 or 15 years is people at the end of their life. And I felt like, I think one of the reasons that I accepted the offer to really come and be on the panel to be able to speak uh, to the testimony of Jack's work as having influenced my own work um, there were just some basic, as a segue into just talking about that a bit, there were some very basic concepts that I resonated with so much in, the, in our teaching about prospective transformation and how Jack was talking about it in the, at the originally, back in the mid-80s even. And um, one of them was this phrase, you know, we're caught in our history and reliving it. And, I, you know, I don't think that that hasn't come up here yet today, but it, in so many ways we're talking about the ways that we're trying to, to catapult ourselves out of that being caught in the history and reliving it. And that has just constantly resonated with me as I am going on about my work in the healthcare arena, in education in healthcare and in the area of quality and compliance where we're constantly trying to improve our practice through education. Um, so that was one very strong uh, resonance constantly about looking, critically examining our assumptions about where it is that we're going, where, what it is that we're doing in our work, and to the extent that when I have translated this into end-of-life care, we look at the power of, of the idea of a prospective transformation when somebody gets a terminal disease, uh, a prognosis of a terminal disease. In hospice, one has to have six months or less of life expectancy with two doctors to say that you now are eligible for hospice care because this is what we see. This is, we see 180 days approximately at the end of your life. And so that in this United States with the Medicare system at the point is, at is, is gives us that opportunity to have that hospice care, which is a rich interdisciplinary care from, and, and it's mandated interdisciplinary care, nurses, social workers, spiritual care people, physicians, um, uh, people who come into the home and bathe people, all of those very real peop very real healthcare practitioners that come and try to be part of that, that uh, ushering of the person through the end of their life. Um, I really wondered about, I did not get to talk with Jack in the last year of his life, and I really wondered if he knew and this is a bit shocking when we think, you know, when we think we're memorializing people, I think a lot of times we think of it as um, something that is, thank you, uh, something that is lauding and we're talking about a very ethereal ideas and sometimes very practical realities in the way those ideas have lived. And yet it's the life of that person that at that moment has been living and at that moment is being asked to allow itself to let go and to 
to make some kind of ultimate transformation into some unknown space, right, for us all. So um, that, that area of my work in these last 13 years has just been so profound to be able to relive that with people. Sometimes they're able to relive it, sometimes they're not, sometimes it's not as comfortable. Um, I think I just want to say one, two, three, and I thought I was going to do this in five minutes to begin with. Um, I think some of the challenges that we have are still in relationships and the power in relationships, and especially in healthcare, we have a lot of that to be working on. Um, and, and I think the, um, but learning in a relationship, I think, is where our strength is. And um, so lauding to, to Lyle's work. So thank you much. We've talked about death, we've talked about recognition, uh, now we're gonna talk about leadership. So, um, a, uh, a, broad, a broad array of topics. I'm honored to be here with um, the people who taught me transformative learning theory, and um, Lyle being my dissertation advisor, certainly Victoria Jeannie and Terry Malpia, who's in the audience. Um, so I'm going to be sharing a few insights related to um, my dissertation, which was looking at the role of personally transformative learning in leadership development. I'm just getting up to my slides here. Um, and so the overarching inquiry that really um, framed this work was around what kind of learning leads to lasting changes in leadership behaviors and, and outcomes? So it was really, that, that was sort of the, the overarching inquiry. And um, there were a few elements sort of at play as I was thinking about this question. So one was um, my work in leadership development and as an executive coach and really hearing as people were coming and asking for assistance um, in making a transition to a larger role or leading an organizational change initiative, being asked to be something in a sense more than they were in that moment, um, to, to Ellie's point of, of sort of uh, in over my head, um, as, as Keegan talks about, and um, being very interested in that kind of deep level of learning. I think all of us who probably have taken time on a Saturday to be at this panel at 5 p.m are attracted to this idea in transformative learning of the possibility of change. And, and I was certainly one of those people. Um, I also at that time had the opportunity to be a research assistant um, at a business school that was doing a, a, a research project looking at the impact of their senior executive program on participants. And so it was this rare opportunity to sort of look at, at short-term longitudinal data. So we were conducting pre-program interviews, post-program interviews, six months after people had complete, completed this one, th this one month program, so pretty intensive experience. And then we would interview them six months after they completed the program, and they also had 360 feedback from before the program and a year after. So again, to the relational element, it just seemed like this very rich opportunity. Um, and so as I was conducting these interviews, I was hearing themes in what the part and how the participants were describing their learning that sounded very engaging. That so and it sounded like there were some differences, that for some people there was a kind of learning or kind of experience that, um, that really enabled some different kind of outcome. And I wanted to study that more systematically. It was also the time that I was taking Jeannie's uh, Intro to Adult Ed class where we read a piece by Patricia Cranton on transformative learning, and I just fell in love you know, with this idea. So this is a, a quote from, from a piece of Jack's work in 95, and it really, um, so he says here, learning becomes transformative when a distorted, inauthentic, or otherwise unjustified assumption is replaced with a newer transformed point of view or habit of mind, resulting in more differentiated, complex, inclusive, reflective meaning structure as a guide to action. So what I, what I really, what I ended up doing in my study was operationalizing those words and really using them as deductive codes. And so I was really interested in going through these transcripts and saying, could I, and I also had two blind reviewers sort of say, can we hear differences in the kind of learning that we identify as personally transformative or not? And so um, we did that and it was a, a rigorous process, thanks to good, <laughs> good advisement and support. And um, so there were some very interesting findings. So 
Um, I'm, these were the two research questions that really inform, that were the, the basis of my dissertation. I'm only going to be talking about the first now, um, and that really is, did participants who experienced personally transformative learning generate different in, uh, um, outcomes, and I was looking at the individual, interpersonal, and organizational level, than participants who didn't. And so there, I created a control group to sort of compare those outcomes. So that was the, the sort of formal research question. And so the answer was yes, uh, which was exciting, right, to sort of see. And so some of the specifics around the kinds of outcomes that were generated um, that were different were at the individual level, um, those leaders who, who we identified as having experienced personally transformative learning, again, becoming more reflective, inclusive, et cetera, um, reported being more energized, again, six months after the program, um, putting more focus on relationships to this theme of relationship that we're talking about, um, a, a more focus on personal values and also an expanded view of leadership. So one, an, an illustrative quote that came from one of the participants says, I was probably one of those guys that came in with a real pessimistic attitude at the beginning. Program X has definitely had a huge impact on the way I look at myself, the way I kind of portray myself, and the way I hold myself up. It's watching what I say, it's watching what I do, and thinking about what really makes someone a leader. So I think some of the things I brought away were pretty profound. You can see yourself as a leader, but you're not a leader until other people see you as one. Um, so sort of that individual change. There were also shifts at the interpersonal level, um, and so this was really uh, people named increased focus on relationships, just again to say there may be a critique of the theory as being cognitive, but the experience of transformative learning has this effective relational uh, element. Spending more time listening to coworkers, less impulsive and aggressive, which sort of has that emotionally intelligent uh, tune, and then taking a more participatory approach to leadership. And so an illustrative quote here, communicating with people, the conversations I have, trying to continue down the path of really engaging people and getting them to feel a sense of ownership in their business, in their future, and a broader interest in what's going on. You know, what ties, which ties in very well with one of the key points from Program X, which was the only sustainable competitive advantages is to learn fast from the competition, and to do that, you need to engage everyone in your business. So an individual sense of self, but also then sort of an increased belief in the need for relationship and, and that interpersonal engagement. Um, lastly, at the organizational level, again, these leaders who were identified as having this kind of learning um, I d sort of talked about having more success at these broader levels, using themselves in a different way. So more successful attempts at team building, successful attempts at instituting new policies, and also supporting overall organizational culture change. So this quote really sort of speaks to the connection between um, individual results and the organizational level by saying, we're going for organization-wide culture change here and it's quite challenging. I think I've helped with the change that we're going through because I've been comfortable with it. My team has been quicker than those, than other teams to become comfortable with it too. You know, they are a lot farther forward than a lot of their peers whose line manager is still struggling with it personally. Um, so I think just, just very quickly, while, while self-report self data, there's always a challenge to that. <laughs> uh, and, and part of what was important in terms of this study was that I also was looking at the pre- and post-program 360 feedback. And so what we saw was that um, leaders who were identified in that uh, personally as having experienced personally transformative learning also um, were rated by their 360 raters as having made statistically significant improvements on 11 competencies compared to only one competency for the non-personally transformative learning group, which was a really good, you know, again, recognition that these, this wasn't just a self-perception, others were experiencing it as well. So, um, and these, so just there are some, in terms of implications, I think really thinking about these, um, these elements as, uh, from, from Mesro's theory, as um, sort of building blocks of competencies. In the coaching program, we talk about really listening for a client's frame of mind and, and using that as a baseline for development. And so listening for these pieces is a, is a real way, I think, that we can add value in uh, the work that we do as educators. So thank you. So the question has to do with how the repair that might have occurred in, earlier in your life uh, happens uh, if you are going to engage in uh, transform transformative learning and in rec through recognition theory, I think. So I'm going to turn this over to Dr. Fleming here to my left. 
<laughs> Thank you. Hi, it's nice to see you again. Hi, how are you? Good. Um, I, the answer is kind of straightforward enough because once you understand how a child develops and how we grow through adolescence and into adulthood, uh, the only way of achieving a sense of identity and achieving subjectivity is through other people, through their feedback, through their support, always through their love, their care. Uh, it strikes me that if we start in that place, we then know what good teaching might be like. Uh, in a very limited time frame, if, we, if I leave that as a, as a hint, and that's exactly what Hamath is on about. Because as, 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 as adults, uh, in intimate and mature relationships, we grow and develop. Hear you in the back. That's okay. the problem. Uh, this is for Dr. Ciparin. I was fascinated with your study about looking at people who had uh, gone through the transformational learning and those who hadn't and their effectiveness as leaders. I've studied change management programs and s statistics are that two-thirds of change management programs fail, which kind of agrees with your statistics that without this transformational learning, there was roughly, you know, there was a variance, but it was about, a th at best, a third of them had success. But even with your program, you had less than half of a success rate. What's the hope for the future? <laughs> That's not a small question. Um, what is, I, I think that having an intention, so, I, and I think that, that Ellie's work actually speaks to the difficulty of what it means to, can people hear, what, it, that, that when we, t I think we need to have a real learning and uh, appreciation for the commitment it takes to have the kind of learning that's necessary. And I think that there's often a desire, fueled obviously often by profit or efficiency, to move more quickly than people's capacity allows. And so I think it's about recognizing the time that's necessary for this kind of learning and forgetting the kind of buy-in and relational sort of participation for people to really understand and engage based on where they are and what their values are. So. Uh, the Mesros, um, as part of their uh, contribution to the college, have left some a little bit of money to the college for a, a scholarship fund, and uh, their son, I believe, also uh, put some money into that. There's they are their son Andy Mesro is a fisherman uh, up in Alaska, uh -huh. a lovely guy, um, a man of few words. <laughs> so he's not here today. But uh, I'm going to turn this over to Lewis and uh, Michael. Um, Michael is Palmieri is in our our current master's program and is part of a student group. And uh, Lewis is in the development office and they're just gonna say a few words about this scholarship fund if, uh, if you have some spare change hanging around in your uh, accounts or whatever and would like to contribute to help us provide scholarships to students who would like to continue studying in this area. So uh, Michael and Lewis. There we go. Hi there, so <laughs> first and foremost let's get First and foremost, let's give a warm hand to this fantastic panel. As Dr. Marsick mentioned, my name is Michael Palmieri. I'm one of the leaders of the Organizational Leadership Association, which is the official student and alumni organization representing the Adult Learning and Leadership Program. One of our uh, commitments is to engage our students and our alumni throughout the years and to create a supportive community for individuals in the school and after they've graduated. And um, we're excited to be able to support this new initiative of the Edie and Jack Mesro uh, scholarship. So to tell you a little bit about the mechanics, I'm going to pass this microphone to Lewis. And for those of you interested in more information, Marjorie over there by the exit will have a little pamphlet for you as to how to go about going um, about making a donation. So Lewis. Good afternoon. I'm Lewis Loray. I'm the director of planned giving here at Teachers College. And it's really a privilege to be in that position because part of my job is to ensure the legacy of wonderful alums and faculty that uh, uh, have such a, a warm place in their heart with Teachers College. 
Now, uh, Jack and Edie, through their will, have left a certain amount of money, and in speaking with Andy, he has decided to also give an additional gift. Uh, these monies total up half of what is needed for an endowed scholarship. So um, what we're looking for is all of the, the wonderful friends and students and fans of Jack and Edie to help us reach the uh, other half of this scholarship, which will go to supporting students studying in adult learning. Uh, the flyer that you'll get in the back will give you an easy way to do this, either by mail or uh, on the website. Uh, we have a secure page for credit card donations, which is also very easy. Um, just a short story. Uh, Grace Dodge died in 1914, and she, in her will, she left money to establish a named endowed scholarship. It was the first planned gift that TC received. Over a hundred years later, that scholarship is still assisting students. So really, I can't think of any better way to remember someone and have a legacy at Teachers College than to create a named endowed scholarship. So I hope that you'll all consider a gift. Uh, it's eminently doable. We're over halfway there. So um, I do hope that you'll consider a gift. Thank you. The Andy Mesro has dedicated a bench in Central Park to Jack Aww. and Edie Mesro. And I have the information, we'll post it on our Adult Learning and Leadership website. And all he asks is that if you go to sit on that bench, if you take a picture of yourself on there and send it to Andy. Oh, so, I hope you'll all sit in Central Park and remember Jack and Edie. Aww.